wonderful intern that we had here in Jackson County uh, was uh, super passionate about this topic as well. And I was kind of working on this presentation when she was doing her rotation um, and was very willing to uh, offer insight and help me with research. And she developed a literature review for me to use uh, for this presentation. So a lot of um, the nitty gritty work was done by her. But I'm not, I'm not sure where she's at right now, but I wanted to give her some credit. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay. So the objectives today um, are that to recognize the impact of weight stigma and personal biases. We will explore some weight inclusive approaches, uh, promote all aspects of health and well being for people of all sizes. And then uh, we'll work on, I have a few case studies that I've put together. So that'll be the application piece. Um, so we, with that said, I'm going to focus on some of the key points pulled from that literature review go over the weight inclusive philosophies or the approaches that are out there, go over some of those case studies, and then give you guys some tips or tools for uh, incorporating this in, in our jobs now. And then Cheryl asked me to give you guys a little bit of background on myself. So, um, and it kind of how I came to find um, the Body Trust uh, certification program um, and why I kind of got into that work. So first of all, um, I went to school at the University of Idaho, and that is where I did um, my dietetic program. And it was, I know each program can kind of be different, and I'm starting to realize that the more uh, I have interns um, and learn how, what kind of concepts um, or things that we uh, they are teaching dietetic students now. I would say kind of how Julia was saying, Oregon is kind of ahead of the curve when it comes to some new age things or learning um, more cutting edge, I guess, research and stuff. I felt like the University of Idaho was sort of the same thing. They had a huge focus on Ellen Satter. Um, so a lot of us called ourselves Ellen Satter dietitians. Um, so that was kind of like my first taste into um, some of the intuitive eating or the health at every size. Um, but I had one teacher there that I really admired. Um, and she really drove home the message of bioindividuality. I mean, she said that term so much that we joked about it all the time um, when we, it was coming up with like medical nutrition therapy and stuff. But it really was a good message. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone has heard of it or they don't know what it is, but it really is that each of us is unique uh, and we have unique food and lifestyle needs. So there's not that one size fits all. Um, there's not, my plate is not applicable to everyone and neither are recommended daily allowances or certain weights or all of this. Um, so I'm really appreciative that she gave, that she kind of drove that message home for us. Also, I've noticed with uh, dietetic programs that an introduction into an eating disorder course is not required by the academy, but it is usually offered in some programs as a, um, what would you call it? Well, just a course you could take on the side. So I ended up taking a course on eating disorders from someone who had an eating disorder. And that was just kind of mind blowing. Um, a lot of my preconceived notions um, or the information that I thought I knew about the diagnostic criteria just kind of went out the window um, after learning from her. But because of that, I became really interested in working with maladaptive eating behaviors and eating disorders. So after that, um, part of my rotation, I actually worked for the St. Luke's Children's Hospital in Boise before coming out to Oregon. And part of my rotations in the dietetic program 
was to work with uh, the dietitians who did outpatient eating disorder treatment for adolescents. And all of this stuff and all the stuff I had learned before um, just kept making me question some of the things we are recommending or not recommending. I felt like I just kept having more questions in how we talk to families or clients or individuals on eating disorder recovery. Uh, okay, so next I went to, I ended up getting a job here in Jackson County. And part of that stipulation, or part of the job was that I was going to spend about a day a week with the mental health department and um, with the hopes of starting, like implementing, creating an outpatient eating disorder treatment team with um, one of the therapists here. And we ended up doing that. However, it was very short-lived. We were only able to do it for about six months. Um, Jackson County lost a lot of funding in mental health. Um, and with that went a lot of the programs that were started and a lot of the therapists. So we lost um, that opportunity. But during those six months, I feel like I learned so much from the therapist I worked with. Um, it was kind of like this weekly outpatient eating disorder treatment we did for people who were considered more high functioning or not. They were considered kind of low level when it came to uh, eating disorder treatments, meaning they didn't need something inpatient uh, or weren't in a critical point in recovery. So I spent a lot of time on um, individual and group treatment with a group of people. And then came um, the statewide meeting, not this one, but the one before that, where Hillary Knivy, um, one of the founders of Be Nourished, was presenting at uh, the Oregon statewide meeting. And it was, I was actually just hired. And um, Debbie, um, our boss then, had said, she's actually on the phone now, but she had recommended um, very gently to all of us that I, you can go to any of the training sessions that you want to, but I would really like if you guys all went to this one. And then, um, so we listened to Hillary's presentation that gave me the introduction to what body trust was and what their program was. And I was so intrigued and noticed that a lot of it paralleled with my own beliefs and a lot of things that I was learning with that therapist I worked with, with the outpatient treatment team. So through a lot of talking, after that meeting was done, Debbie and I had talked a lot about, you know, starting the body trust training and looking into that um, and then decided that it was worth it uh, for me and another to uh, go ahead and start that training. Um, it was a very long process. Like I said, I just finished last month. It took about a year altogether, but it was very invaluable. Um, I can't tell you how many, how many moments of growth there were for me this past year in learning a lot of these. I've highlighted some of them, um, and a lot of them are words or phrases that Dana and Hillary, the founders of Be Nourished, would use, and they've really stuck with me. And one of them is you start to unlearn, and I feel like I've done a lot of that. So a lot of, like I said, the preconceived notions are things that you have with around other people or those in larger bodies or uh, people with eating disorders. Um, you kind of push those aside and start to learn another way. But because of this, um, it's kind of impossible to do a lot of this training without doing it yourself. Um, and I think that's, it's an ongoing process. I'm not going to say I'm the best role model at body positivity, but I've definitely moved towards more body acceptance. Um, and I've highlighted that it is a mourning process, um, but there is a saying um, from Hillary that you can't go further with your clients than you have gone yourself. Meaning I can't be on the latest fad diet, but then continue to recommend that my clients follow a haze approach because you're going to, that connection with them is not going to be authentic. So 
But part of that moving towards body acceptance, I think I started to learn more about self-compassion and practicing that. And I think that's where many will find freedom. Um, Because when we look at our behaviors with shame, we learn very little about ourselves. And self-compassion can decrease a lot of negative self-talk. It widens the lens on the acceptability of a variety of bodies, and it decreases hyper-focus on your perceived flaws. So that's a little bit of my background. Um, Oh, and I also wanted to say that if anyone just wants to, like, shout out or ask questions to feel free, um, usually when I'm having this conversation, it's a lot more um, casual, and I... I don't mind that. So if anyone just wants to interrupt or kind of jut in, um, they are more than welcome to. But without that, I do want some participation now. Um, Kind of, I would like uh, to just kind of start out and ask others to share what they feel or think normal eating is. It can be a simple like one letter, I mean, one word, one sentence, or just kind of what you define as normal eating. If anyone's willing to go first. (laughs) Enjoyment. Enjoyment, that's a good one. It's all relative, says Ilan. <laughs> That's good. That's a good way to do it, is, is be able to type it in. We can... Are people typing them in? Yeah, we've got... <clears throat> it's Audrey, hunger and fullness and understanding. Oh, it's gone. Honoring hunger and fullness and understanding that social eating is part of normal eating. Perfect. I love that. Eating what you love. Yes. Any others? Balance. Listening to cravings. Listening to what? Cravings. Oh, yes. Not feeling guilty. Very true. Any others? That was not apologizing for what you I love that. (laughs) Following hunger cues? Yes. Like we do when we're infants. Um, Mindful eating versus mindless eating, knowing feelings of sadie versus hunger. I think those are all really great answers, Um, and it kind of encompasses what's always been my motto as far as normal eating, and it's Ellen Satter's definition of that. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but it is available on the slide. I'm sure others have seen this before, and in fact, when I was applying to the Body Trust uh, certification program, I had um, put this as you know, something that had been my motto as a dietitian and what I had learned in school is normal eating. When I first read it, though, I thought, oh, my gosh, this is so wordy and there's way too many things going on with it. But I think that the main premise is that last sentence, that normal eating varies in response to your hunger, your schedule, your proximity to food and your feelings. And that pretty much encompasses everything everyone just shared. So the next part, I'm going to talk a little bit about that literature review that um, the intern and I had worked on and just kind of point out some of the main points um, or some of the things we kept seeing uh, when looking up a lot of this. So one of the um, journals we were looking at was in Brain Science Journal, and it really kept talking about this this large study that was done um, and was showing that 
what people had to actually go through and what they had to do to maintain weight loss. And it started suggesting that um, the, there was a lack of long-term success in dieting uh, due to natural neural mechanisms that occur in all of us, which was suggesting that there's a set point. And for those of us that aren't sure what a set point is, um, it is our body's natural tend- tendency to be a specific weight. So for those who've never dieted before or feel like um, they're comfortable in their hunger fullness cues, all of this, or they've, they're reaching more body acceptance, you'll start to see that by doing these things, your body tends to stay at a certain weight. And that's what we usually call the set point. Um, But it explains why chronic dieting has been unsuccessful in long-term changes to our body weight. Because the more we try to deviate from that set point, our body kind of fights back with us. And so once we go off of restriction or dieting, um, people will, will, I'm sure we've all heard, end up telling us, well, I gained it all back and then some. Um, and that's because our body kind of rebelled against the diet and was like, no, I don't want to be there. Like, this is where our body is. And it sounds really, um, simple, but it actually is kind of a newer concept to talk about set points. Did someone have a question about that? So um, there also was a study done by MIT that showed that a person's weight at their set point is actually optimal for efficient activity, um, for improving moods or or being in a more optimistic mood. And when set points are driven too low, um, that's when lethargy can set in, and which is obviously a way of slowing a person down. Uh, I wanted to point out, though, this main study in Brain Sciences Journal did talk um, about what it took for people to actually maintain that weight loss. Um, And because they really wanted to point out how difficult and almost insane it sounded. Uh, But in order for them to maintain the weight loss, they needed to maintain a daily caloric deficit of 400 calories a day and exercise more than a non-dieter for at least three to five years. So for um, that amount of time, three to five years, obviously a long time, but they had to exercise more than someone who's not dieting and maintain a caloric deficit, which is why they could be so impossible to follow. I thought that was pretty profound and kind of spelling it out though. We also found, and I'm sure a lot of people can agree, that weight stigma continues to be a problem in the healthcare community. And it was very intentional intentional to use um, the obesity journal and defining weight stigma because I just kind of felt it was ironic that they do a lot of research to see why diets aren't working, but then at the same time, they're talking about weight stigma and what that is. And it's really negative attitudes and beliefs directed towards individuals due to their weight. Um, so while we were sifting through this research, though, uh, it was kind of prevalent, or we kind of noticed that Uh, Weight stigma is prevalent in the North American society, and it's often rooted in negative weight-based stereotypes, Uh, especially that overweight individuals are lazy, unintelligent, weak-willed, lacking in self-discipline, and unwilling to make the changes necessary to lose weight. Um, Obviously, these stereotypes perpetuate bias against persons who are considered overweight or obese um, as defined by their BMI, and they are present in multiple domains of life, including the workplace, healthcare settings, educational institutions, the media. Um, but really, a particular concern studies have consistently documented weight bias among healthcare providers, and that includes us. Um, what they're talking about is negative stereotypes 
uh, by physicians, nurses, dietitians, psychologists, fitness professionals. A lot of these providers have reported views that who they define as obese are lazy, they lack in self-control, undisciplined, and they're non-compliant with treatment. And that they believe that these personality characteristics are the central causes of obesity rather than genetic or environmental factors. And this, um, a lot of that information came from the International Journal of Eating Disorders. Weight stigma can also include uh, what they call microaggressions. And those are intentional or unintentional, verbal, behavioral, or environmental and dignities that communicate hostility or negativity toward people who hold less power uh, in society. And then also weightism, which is a new term, which has to do with appearance-related compliments. So those are those times that, say you lose weight, either intentional or unintentional, and people start complimenting you, telling you how great you look. That's actual weight stigma, because it's kind of telling someone you weren't great before and they're reinforcing those ideas that you should be on that diet. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about that? No. Okay. So just to continue a little bit, um, why kind of, why is this information relevant? I believe it is because weight-based stereotypes held by healthcare professionals, that they include us, ultimately have important implications for the quality of care that patients receive. So with some research showing that weight bias in the healthcare setting serves as a barrier for larger body people seeking healthcare and treatment. There's been so many studies and research and information out there that shows that a lot of the time people who are in larger bodies don't seek healthcare or go to the physician, midwives, whoever as often as what society considers normative weight because they're afraid of experiencing that weight stigma. And for those with eating disorders, it's actually showed um, that it increases some binge eating disorders or emotional eating behaviors in those who have um, a diagnosed eating disorder, which is pretty scary. And I wanted to point out that it is standard practice for primary care physicians, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, whoever we are going to, to, per, um, to recommend that any person with a BMI greater than 30 is to be provided a weight loss intervention. And um, this is not person-centered care. We, what I see is, so say you go to the doctor and your BMI is blah, 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 it triggers on the physician's computer screen or whatever electronic medical records they are using. And they actually have to like check mark on in one of the boxes that they actually talked about weight loss interventions with this person. So that is pathologizing someone and making assumptions about how this person lives or eats based off of their BMI alone. So with that said, a lot of times when I'm having this conversation with other um, dietitians, um, we kind of laugh about it, but it, it does seem pretty serious. Um, for example, we can't just look at someone and say what their A1C is or what their cholesterol is or their blood pressure. So why do we make assumptions that because someone's BMI lies in a certain number that we know how they are how they're exercising, how they're eating, basically how they are living their life. Does anyone have any comments about that? So this just kind of shows that a weight normative approach, which is one that emphasis, emphasizes weight loss as an independent health, health concern, is more documented health risks than a weight inclusive approach, which is an approach that focuses on non-weight related health concerns. 
And it kind of just begs the question, all this research and understanding of diet culture, um, do we need a different approach? <sighs> Health professionals do have a responsibility to provide care, and I believe that care should in include a weight-inclusive approach. Because as studies have shown, a weight-inclusive approach would adhere to most health professionals' ethical principle to first do no harm. And I know with re, uh, looking at the dietitian's um, code of ethics, physicians, pretty much any healthcare professional, um, it pretty much says that. But are we helping without harming um, when we're making assumptions about how people live based off of their BMI or their weight alone? Um, I also believe we have a we have a responsibility to provide care that focuses on a weight inclusive approach that focuses on their behaviors and not their weight. There is stronger evidence to suggest that factors or behaviors contribute um, to poor health outcomes rather than weight alone. So that's when we're hearing all the time about fruit and veggie intake, uh, exercise all these other recommendations, those are, those are behaviors um, independent of weight. So say someone starts exercising um, to reduce their risk of cardiovascular health because some certain measure was up or their blood pressure, then they go to the doctor and uh, they say that their blood pressure is now within normal limits. We can say or contribute that to a change in their behavior, regardless if they have lost weight lost weight or not. It's not the weight loss. It was the actual behavior. Also, um, I believe in encouraging body trust and intuition uh, because greater, greater internal awareness and body appreciation is associated with a higher adherence to eating based on physiological hunger and satiety cues. So all that stuff that we are teaching to our clients, especially our breastfeeding moms, like when they say, is my baby getting enough? Uh, it seems like we have so much knowledge and we feel so comfortable around those hunger and fullness cues and signs to look for, but that kind of goes away. Um, and we kind of get away from that as the child gets older um, or even into adulthood. Um, also, I believe that as healthcare professionals, we have a responsibility to reduce weight stigma and encourage better self-care and psychological health. Uh, people are more likely to take care of their bodies if they appreciate and have positive feelings toward their bodies. Studies have shown people in larger bodies, like I said, do not participate as frequently in doctor visits in comparison to those who are considered in a weight normative body. To, to summarize um, that literature review, a lot of the research that was seen, uh, a weight-inclusive approach rests on the assumption that every body is capable of achieving health and well-being well independent of weight when given access to non-stigmatizing health care. And before we move on to some of the weight-inclusive philosophies, I think this is a good time to check in um, or to clarify anything. Uh, or if anyone has any questions or comments that they want to make. So, did someone just say something? I just was checking in the room to see if there's any comments um, here, and I, yeah, I think we're ready to dive in. Okay, perfect. So um, I'm going to talk about three of the most popular weight inclusive philosophies um, or the ones that we as dietitians hear about the most or have a, uh, when someone brings up, we're kind of more familiar with them. The first one being health at every size, otherwise known as haze. And sometimes I might refer to it as that um, intuitive eating and then body trust. So health at every size. I know I um, last week when Cheryl had sent out the introduction to this course, I had include it had included some of the principles of health at every size. Um, did everyone get a chance to look at that? Are they needing some review? 
I'd seen heads shaken here that they, they read that. Perfect. So um, for those where Health at Every Size is kind of a new concept, it is trademarked um, under the Association for Size, Diversity, and Health. Um, they have a model that supports the health of people across the weight spectrum, and they challenge the current, current cultural oppression of higher weight people, um, otherwise known as fat phobia. Um, their model seeks to end the stigmatizing of health problems, uh, which is called healthism. Um, and healthism is also a relatively new term, um, and I think it's best described by Lucy Affermore, one of the uh, authors of um, a Health at Every Size approaches. Uh, she does a lot of the research with Linda Bacon, um, but she talks about healthism um, and says that it is a belief system that sees health as the property and responsibility of an individual and ranks the personal pursuit of health above everything else, including world peace or being kind. It ignores the impact of poverty, oppression, war, violence, luck, historical atrocities, abuse, and the environment. It protects the status quo. It can lead to victim blaming and privilege, increases health inequities, and fosters internalized oppression. Healthism judges people's human worth according to their health. And that seems pretty powerful for that one little word. It has a lot of meaning. Hayes acknowledges that weight is not a behavior or a personal choice and that normal human bodies come in a wide range of weights and it seeks alternatives to the overwhelmingly futile and harmful practice of pursuing weight loss. So these are some of those principles or the ones that we sent out that everyone had looked at. And we don't, I don't have to read those, but I wanted to say that where th this approach came from, um, the framing for the Hayes approach actually came from discussions among many healthcare workers and consumers, including dietitians um, and pretty much those who rejected both the use of weight, size, or BMI as a proxy for health and the myth that weight is a choice. The Hayes approach honors healing power of social connections. It really evolves in response to the experiences and needs of a, of a diverse community and grounds itself in a social, social justice framework. So a lot of stuff there. There was a study that we looked at um, of participants following a health at every size model um, and it showed that they achieved statistically and clinically significant improvements in their physiological measures, including blood pressure, behavioral practices. Um, there was some increased physical activity and decreased binge eating for those with binge eating disorder. Um, it improved psychological measures. Uh, people had increased reported self-esteem and said um, that some of their depressive symptoms had also decreased by following a health at every size model. The study also obviously showed no adverse outcomes, um, but it was done by the health at every size authors. And that kind of sums up that since I had sent out a lot of information on Hayes beforehand. And Megan? Yes. We did get one comment. Christine Shepard said it was a great resource, and thank you very much. Oh, of course. Thank you, Christine. Um, the next weight inclusive approach, and I, I'm not sure if I want to just say it's weight inclusive, but it's some other framework kind of models health at every size um, and just kind of talks about a new way of eating. However, I have seen intuitive eating get picked apart too, and I know there is um, some negativity towards it, uh, but I do think uh, um, in the long run, the message can be quite simple, and that's just to reject dieting. Um, is everyone familiar with intuitive eating and the 10 steps that they recommend? Seen shaking of heads in the room. Yes. Okay, good. Um, so I'll just go over it briefly. It was a model um, by Evelyn Triboli and Elise Risch, um, both dietitians. Um, and it's kind of become a resource in the nutrition community for creating uh, what they call a healthy relationship with food, mind, and the body. 
their first stance is to reject the diet mentality. And what that means is if you have old magazine articles, diet books, anything that's offering you this false hope of losing weight quickly, um, get rid of them. Also, um, they recommend getting angry <laughs> at some of the lies that they feel like you have been led to feel as if you were a failure every time a new diet stopped working and you gained back all of that weight. Because they think if you allow even one small hope to linger that a new and better diet might be lurking around the corner, it will prevent you from being free to rediscover intuitive eating. And that's pretty much the first step. Um, they look at honoring your hunger. So meaning keep your body fed when you're hungry. Also making peace with food. Um, Cheryl, I think it was you that said your definition was enjoyment. Um, and I think we kind of go away from that. Um, so kind of calling a truce and stop the food fight, giving yourself unconditional permission to eat. If you tell yourself that you can't or shouldn't have a particular food, it can actually lead to intense feelings of deprivation that build into uncontrollable cravings and often binging that particular item, <coughs> um, which I'm sure a lot of people can relate to or have heard this from some of our clients. Um, I've heard it described as um, by prevent or telling yourself that you can't have that food it results in last supper overeating i thought that was a good way to describe it they say to challenge that food police um so the food police can be that voice in your head that's telling you that food is not good for you and kind of screaming no to it uh, because you're not bad it's not a moral obligation to not eat chocolate cake um, the food police monitor the unreasonable rules that dieting has created. So, chasing the food police away is a critical step in returning to intuitive eating. We want to respect our fullness as well. Listen for the body signals that tell you that you are no longer hungry. Observe the signs that show that you're comfortably full. That could be pausing in the middle of a meal or food and ask yourself how it tastes. Um, or what your current fullness level is. Um, sometimes you could say, I can't take another bite. That's a pretty good indicator that you're full. Step six is discovering that satisfaction factor. So again, going back to the enjoyment piece, there's a lot of times where I've had people tell me when talking about their diet that they eat for fuel. And at first I wouldn't have thought anything of it, but I'm like, what fun is there in that? Their food is very cultural, um, and it, it, it should be an enjoyable part of living. We often overlook one of the most basic parts of existence, and um, that can be found in an eating experience. Also, honoring our feelings, finding ways to comfort, distract, or resolve your issues without using food. It may comfort for the short term, distract from pain, or even numb us into food hangovers, but food sometimes doesn't solve the problem. If anything, eating from an emotional hunger will only make you feel somewhat worse in the long run. You'll ultimately have to deal with the source of the emotion as well as the discomfort of overeating. I've seen this one, number seven, really get picked apart as well um, because I do even believe, and through experience and working with people who are diagnosed with eating disorders, that sometimes there is that comfort piece. And it's hard to take that away from someone. So number eight is respecting your body. And that could also mean accepting your genetic blueprint or that set point where our body, just like a person with a shoe size of eight would not expect to realistically squeeze into a size six. It is equally as futile and uncomfortable to have that same expectation with our body size. It's hard to reject the diet mentality if we are unrealistic and overly critical about our body shape. Um, exercise, feel the difference. Um, here they're usually saying forget that vigorous exercise or that militant feeling that you have to exercise until you vomit. Um, what they're saying is to, if you want to get active, feel the difference. Shift your 
shifting your focus to more about how it feels to move your body rather than the calorie burning effect of exercise. So you're not exercising as punishment, you're doing it for enjoyment. Also honoring your health. Um, this is gentle nutrition, making food choices that honor your health and taste buds that also make you feel well. Um, sometimes I've had people say, well, if I have celiac disease and I'm craving bread, should I eat it? Um, well, if it's gluten-free, I would say yes, uh, because a part of honoring your health is also honoring um, things that wouldn't make you feel good or could upset your medical condition. Any questions about intuitive eating? Nope. So the last one is body trust. And this is the one that I obviously feel the most comfortable with. Um, and I'm sure it's more familiar to people since we've had had them as guest speakers before and this has been presented on. Um, but it was founded in Portland and that's where their office is. In 2005, their focus is considered body trust. Um, they offer programs, workshops, retreats, um, some e-courses, anyone uh, that are interested in this information. Uh, their model is kind of, they even say that a lot of their focus came from the Hayes framework. Um, and they, so they take a lot of that in uh, their trainings as well. Their model was informed by the shame resilience theory. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with that, but it was a theory from Brene Brown, um, who's one of the famous people and talking about shame. Um, but it kind of sits with the idea that if we actually feel the shame um, and talk about it and discuss it, then we can help kind of conquer those feelings instead of when that shame rises, ignoring it, that we, that we have an approach to that. Also, their model um, focuses on self-compassion. Um, they do use, like I said, that work from health at every size. Be Nourish believes that people who live compassionately in the bodies they have will change the world for everyone. Uh, they say that they're a radical revision of what it means to occupy and care for your body, that they are a pathway to acceptance of the body, an alternative dialogue to the conventional paradigm of food, body image, and weight concerns. Body trust is a paradigm-shifting work that invites bravery and body compassion. And they also believe in a, that they are a healing modality and a way out of the predictable, repetitive pattern of dieting, disordered eating, and weight cycling that is fueled by that body shame. Body trust is weight inclusive. Their, um, their work is for all bodies. There isn't a different set of rules for your Anyone, no matter how much you might feel different, isolated, or in need of fixing, uh, they are an invitation to kind of be part of a new conversation about bodies, especially one that nourishes and celebrates who we are and who we can become, including every way we show up in the world. Uh, and this diagram just kind of goes over how all of these approaches intersect. Um, as you can see, they're pretty similar. Intuitive eating and body trust do have a lot of their own set of rules um, or things that they go by, but both of them all encompass the health at every size approach. Any questions about uh, the weight inclusive approaches or philosophies before we move on? We're good to go. So next up is some case studies. Giving the information that um, I have provided. Um, we're gonna, I've kind of created these clients um, based off of ones that I have seen. I've changed names and um, some little information, uh, but I felt like they were really good ways to kind of see well, how would, could we use these in practice. The first one is Sophie. She is a 32-year-old woman. She's six months postpartum and eight pounds over her pre-pregnancy weight. She lives in Medford with a supportive partner and her seven and five-year-old daughters, plus her newborn. They live across from a park and they play there every day. And on the weekends, they like to take the kids out hiking. So Sophie's dietary intake, 
Um, this is what a typical day looks like for her. She usually has cereal uh, with fruit, sometimes adds nut butter. Uh, she said she likes to snack on pretzels or chips or something, cracker, something quick uh, before they go out and play. Uh, lunch is usually leftovers or she'll use their protein and kind of whip up a salad for herself. But she also said that she'll sometimes just eat what she made for her kids, um, whatever they leave left over. This seems pretty typical for moms. Um, sometimes she'll have a snack before dinner, sometimes not. But she said a lot of times she'll just have yogurt, maybe a piece of fruit, or again, those pretzels or chips. Her dinner... Uh, seems pretty typical American dinners that meat, starch, or veggie, tacos, pasta, all of that. Her and the family usually go out twice a week because of their busy schedule. Uh, the kids are getting more involved with extracurricular, so it makes it a little easy for them to, or as a treat to kind of stop in and go out to eat. Uh, she said she loves chocolate-covered almonds and looks forward to those before bed every night. These are Sophie's anthropometrics. And she had mentioned in the appointment that she is concerned that her weight had contributed to her newborn's poor latch. And then before I kind of go into the approaches, I did want to acknowledge that we are all on a continuum of learning, um, kind of based on our education or things that we have perceived in life so far. So um, a lot of these approaches, or especially the traditional approach of not calling out any dietitian in particular, um, but I know that from information we have received as dietitians, it can kind of be that traditional uh, approach to working with her. Um, and I'm just going to put that there. I do believe that in every approach we do affirm um, that people are eating a variety of foods. Um, when she mentions her desire to lose weight, I have heard so many times people just kind of laugh or other people that are with the family just say, oh, we all do, or just don't look at the scale, get it over with, also perpetuating that weight stigma. Um, we could make suggestions that Sophie switch to low-fat yogurt and cut back on going out to eat just once a week encourage her to join an exercise class or and participate in something more vigorous to make progress towards her pre-baby weight. But I didn't want to ignore that she was concerned about her latch and we could refer her to lactation services. Um, does anyone want to chime in or mention, um, does this seem like a pretty typical approach to Sophie? Yes, in the room. Good. And then the next three, I'm just going to leave there, but you can see that there's some similarities, but also some stark differences, especially that health at every size approach. When Sophie shares that she heard from a friend that her body or breast size can affect her latch, I think that's a critical moment for us to kind of talk about breastfeeding positions, that bioindividuality factor, also referring her to a lactation consultant. Um, in the body trust approach, that second bullet, uh, she mentions her desire to lose weight. Um, for me, this really opens up a conversation of um, her body changes during pregnancy. Uh, sometimes I ask about external influences because um, a lot of times when we say we want to lose weight, um, we've heard all of these external influences through media, through friends, through family, and we internalize them and make them our own voice. So trying to differentiate between the two of them. We can discuss how she feels about her current energy level and then work with her to reflect on how her body has shown up for her in her past pregnancies and now as she nourishes her child as well as herself. So it seems like a more person-centered approach. Any comments? I'm going to try. What's that? Uh, Megan, I just was wondering. So um, of those case studies, would that be something that you would document in progress notes? Which part? 
of the for the, the scenarios that you put up there so that you would have some of that language in there for others yes yeah absolutely um, and I would say that we do a pretty good job here. Anytime I've noticed a trend or something where I'm like, I feel like this needs to be addressed. Um, I kind of talk about this at each one of our staff meetings, uh, new concept um, or things that we can do. Or sometimes uh, because it's been a recommendation that any child above the 95th or 99th percentile sees the dietitian. A lot of times I put notes on there to take the focus off of weight and do refer to them, do refer to me because I do want to talk with the family um, and kind of give them my expertise as far as body trust goes. Thank Was you. That? Yep. And I might go through these others pretty quickly because um, I see that we only have about 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes left. Um, this one is a child uh, who's four years old. Um, as you can see, he loves to play Legos. He's learning how to ride his bike. He loves to play tag with his brother. His dietary intake seems typical of a child his age. He likes his Wix cereal um, or scrambled eggs, uh, snacks on some fruits, lunch, quesadilla, chicken nuggets, dinner, again, that meat, starch, veggie. Um, he consumes his eight ounces of his 1% milk because of his age. These are his anthropometrics, and I really wanted to point out how the weight and BMI is very consistent, or that I put that this is consistently here at the 97th percentile. Um, his parents are concerned about his weight and express interest in enrolling him in swimming classes to keep him active, despite a failed attempt last year. And I've had this exact same conversation. This is a pretty similar instance that I had. Um, that traditional approach. Um, also affirming that the child's eating a variety of foods. We can identify his growth along the growth chart. I do sometimes still see that we can get into a habit of showing families their growth chart. And I usually never do unless they ask. Um, sometimes when babies are growing, parents are so excited to see where the baby's at. Um, and they ask, you know, where or so where are they at? And I'll just pull up the growth chart, have them look at it. Um, but I think sometimes always pointing out this is where your child is. This is where they were last time. What changed? Please tell me what happened. Why did they gain weight? Um, can sometimes feel like a personal attack. Um, sometimes as dietitians or healthcare providers, uh, we can say, you know, well, sorry, you didn't like the water. Let's try again. <laughs> Or, um, I see he likes chicken nuggets. Why don't we make those homemade? Again, with the different approaches, um, I think the important thing to me and what I've seen from uh, what other dietitians do now is that we kind of talk about how everyone's body grows and looks differently, but also show how the child's growth is consistent to his own curve, his own trajectory. And I believe Ellen Satter and so many other people are saying that, that I don't care if they're at the two percentile or the 97th, if they're consistently there, what are we worried about? And I really um, wanted to say that same thing about the, it goes to show for those that are on the lower end of these growth curves too. Um, I don't know how many times I've seen children that are at the second or zero or fifth percentile, but you notice that they've been there all along. Family, maybe genetically smaller as well. And the parents end up bringing up that the doctor wants them on Pediasure. And then you kind of go through their diet and you're like, well, I'm not seeing where they would why they need extra calories or why it's almost feeling like we're wanting to force feed them to make them gain weight so we feel better about where they're sitting on the curve if that makes sense and a lot of times our recommendation for who we consider underweight is to just pile on a bunch of fat calories and that takes away from intuitive eating as well and a, a lot of times those kids are taking those messages that their body's not good enough and that we have to drink this Pediasure or you need to take these bites because we've put extra butter in it and it'll be good for you to gain some weight. And they remember those things just like we do. 
So real fast, um, the third case study is a 20-year-old female who's six and a half months pregnant, first pregnancy. Um, she's involved on the dance team. She also likes to run but quit when she became pregnant. She mentions that her friends and family often comment on her weight, um, though she has assured you that she has not been worried about it. Her typical dietary intake, um, she likes a cup of coffee in the morning, a huge bowl of cereal before she's off to school, um, but she'll usually grab a snack from the coffee shop when she's hungry, whatever they have. Um, she mentions that she sometimes skips lunch due to her school schedule, but she packs snacks in her bag, um, like trail mix or cookies or something that she can have while in lecture. Um when we had this conversation, she had had a cheeseburger uh, in a lettuce wrap, um, had made french fries, um, but she also loves all proteins and veggies and says that her partner makes a really good stir fry. She snacks on ice cream, cheese and crackers, or fresh fruit before bed. These are her anthropometrics, pre-pregnancy, current weight. So for reference, she's gained nine pounds in six and a half months. And I did not calculate her BMI. I just didn't feel like it was appropriate. Um, I feel like a lot of people look at this and say, oh, my gosh, we need to get her to gain more weight. And that's what she keeps hearing from her friends and family. Um, that traditional approach, um, when she shares her dietary intake, we mentioned she has a varied diet, but suggests that she could add peanut butter or some butter to her morning banana, um, use a bun, uh, whole milk when cooking, and never skip a meal. Also, she could talk to her doctor about starting Ensure and whole milk. Um, sometimes there's no discussion about physical activity because you could be worried about where she's sitting on the maternal growth chart. Um, through this conversation with her, though, you realize that she is eating intuitively. She's, again, back to that definition of normal eating. She's eating in proximity to her schedule, to her feelings. Um, she's pretty busy at school, uh, but she brings these dense snacks like trail mix, which has chocolate, nuts, uh, dried fruits um, that we know can be calorically dense. But for some reason, we worry that, oh, my gosh, she didn't have lunch. Um, but she is eating and making sure that she has foods with her when she is hungry. Um, so th those other approaches, um, I think the body trust approach, uh, we can ask her ways she finds movement enjoyable now that she is pregnant, explore why she decided to stop running, uh, cause she didn't disclose out except the fact that she's not running anymore. Um, also acknowledge her busy schedule and her self care practices. She loved to dance and she's still continuing to do that. Any questions about these? Um, I also wanted to bring up again how um, in cases like these, uh, I feel like it's completely normal to be somewhat concerned. Um, sometimes we're like, oh, my gosh, are they gaining enough weight? Is there is their baby growing OK? That we have the best intentions when um, we're giving advice or giving handouts. Um, and then but ever since. I've learned a lot of these. I kind of have to wait. What voice is this? That's that. It's that diet culture. It's the diet mentality that's telling me that their body isn't good enough. It's not fitting in that box that we want them to be in and kind of explore with them um, di a different approaches, especially when they are not expressing any concern and you really do get that vibe that they're not worried how how their weight is or how it's being projected. Uh, this is a comparison that I had made through one of um, my body trust uh, homeworks, um, but kind of compare the difference between a diet paradigm and a non-diet. Um, I really liked the food one. I did adapt some of this from the health at every size approach. So some quick tips for incorporating weight neutrality and utilizing Renew. Um, I really love this last year that um, we've kind of taken a deeper dive into person-centered counseling with Renew, um, that we sit with some more difficult topics 
um, and that we have a lot of tools and how to talk to people. Um, I do think it's been really great to have those activities because they help us examine our own bias and privilege and where we sit with those, that implicit bias. Um, because like they've said, there's nothing wrong with it. But in order to learn to grow, we acknowledge it and see what we can do from there. Um, I have heard a lot of feedback when I was working in eating disorders, and I, I'm sure this isn't um, or could be something that can happen in every WIC clinic, but a lot of people that are sit in larger bodies have said that they wished spaces were more inclusive for them. The biggest one being our chairs. Do they have armrests? Because sometimes there's an initial panic. If someone in a large body walks in a room and they're like, I don't know if I can sit in there. Do I try? What do I do? Um, and just the idea of there being chairs with no armrest is already making them feel more comfortable. Also going back to using behaviors as indicators of health um, rather than weight. Um, checking in with your bias, uh, supplying your patient with the same treatment you would provide to a thinner patient with a similar concern. I think that's a really great one um, and kind of seeing where your focus is. Showing compassion for how difficult it is to live in a culturally stigmatized body. Um, I wanted to say that I remember one of our Renew activities um, saying at the bottom that just because it's not your reality doesn't mean it's um, it's not real. So if someone sits there and tells you what is going on in their life and you're having a hard time empathizing, comprehending, sometimes it's easy to just say it's their reality and acknowledging it. And I think that even makes it easier to build empathy or be more person-centered. I've included a lot of references on here in case people want to go back and read all those studies and abstracts. <laughs> and then some of my favorite resources and recommended readings, including that Poodle Science video that we sent out last week. Some podcasts I like that you can sift through. Um, and then a couple... Uh, articles that I thought were really factual and great to read those bottom two. And with that, are there any questions? Oh, there's a lot of information. <laughs> I kind of sped up that last part. Any questions? That, oh, okay. Um, will we be able to access this PowerPoint? Megan, do you have permission for us to be able to post, um, share this? Absolutely. Okay. And hopefully if the recording went well, um, we'll be able to have that um, maybe on a YouTube site that's private. Um, yeah. We'll look at our options for that. Um, um, so I did put a hyperlink to all the recommended resources and recommended readings so you wouldn't have to go searching for them. Any questions on the phone that you want to type in? Or speak to your truth. Um, we're going to open them up. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, Megan, for sharing body trust with the WIC community. We are so lucky to have you as a resource. Um, I love the case studies and the application of the material. Thanks so much. Uh, Megan, uh, Megan, thank you. Oh, thank you. That was from your boss. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, Greg says, Changes when you have a child come in and their growth chart, growth curve is pulling rapidly away from them. Um, so that's a, a good follow up. We could um, how about we start to put that out and we can um, just start a conversation going on that. I think that would be good. Yeah, that would be awesome. One last one, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. And I just want to acknowledge, Megan, I think that uh, this presentation today has been the best attended um, uh, session we have had in the history of lawn. So it's <laughs> a lot that um, people um, really respect and care about this, uh, this topic. So Perfect. And if anyone ever needs more information, um, there's a lot of stuff I obviously didn't include um, and feel like I have a wide base of resource and tools to use um, that they can always reach out to me personally um, and get that. Uh, I also invite if anyone feels like a little bit of discomfort with this information and just processing it, to just to be able to sit with that. Yes. And I'll 
maybe uh, reach out to Megan just to, to explore some of that um, kind of a peer to peer um, type of counseling because it um, it is one where kind of like yeah but or what about this? yes absolutely it, it it is one that we have to rethink and, and especially when we have uh, metrics from our own state coming through with like we want to do BMI on everyone so right. we we do have that reinforced right there so. mm -hmm. We just got a request for a potential part two training. Oh, oh my. <laughs> so, I, um, Megan, on um, behalf of everyone in the room, thank you so much. Um, it, it has been wonderful um, having you go through your eloquent as a speaker, and um, this is something that you speak so wonderfully too. You speak to the heart of it. So thank you so much and thank you everyone for joining. Thank you guys. All right, parking up here. Feel free.